Um, so um, usually lately I'm starting my presentations like I'm Pancho and I'll be speaking today about IoT or hardware, but today is not that day. So today I'll be on completely the other side. Instead of small devices, I'll be talking about containers, I'll be talking about machines, I'll be talking about clusters. Um, so just as an introduction, who am I? So my name is Pancho. I come from Macedonia. Um, yeah, that's me. So um, currently, I'm a senior software engineer in this company in Skopje, Colton, etc. Uh, besides that, I'm also the current leader of the Macedonian Java user group. Also, I'm one of the administrators of this uh, algorithm competition that we're organizing, Code Code for MK. If you're interested in this, check it out. Um, besides just coding, uh, besides just the regular 9 to 5 job, I'm also a huge hardware and IoT enthusiast, and I try to do that as long as possible. Um, from recently, I'm also uh, the initiator of um, the Things Network Skopje. I don't know if you've heard about the Things Network. Probably no one has heard about it. So it's an IoT thing. Uh, has huge potential, nonetheless. There is one for, Bel for Belgrade also, I just found out, but it's still just initializing. And yeah, so that's me on the internet. Uh, every once in a while, I write some blog posts on my personal blog, pancho.mk, and on Twitter, I'm Silomeros, and well, basically everywhere on the internet. Uh, so before I start talking, um, just a small dis uh, disclaimer. So I'm in no way affiliated uh, neither with Google, nor with Pivotal, nor with Docker. Needless, I'll be presenting their technologies. Um, this is not an expert talk, so these are just my experience, uh, my findings, and things that I've been doing in, in my free time. And um, last but not least, uh, I want to say a huge thank to these two guys. So uh, the first one is Ray Tsang. He's a developer advocate at uh, Google for the Google Cloud Platform. Um, and uh, the other guy is Adam Vassing. He's working in this Dutch company called uh, Quintor. Uh, they had a similar presentation at last year, DevOps, and they kind of give me the inspiration for me to do the same thing. And special thanks for Ray, because, um, uh, well, he's the guilty one that I have uh, free Google Cloud uh, credits now in order to do this presentation and to do all the demos. So um, what am I be talking today? So I'll be talking about three things in general. Um, the first thing, Spring Boot. Well, my job here is easy, because there have already been like two or three presentations about Spring Boot. So I believe that everyone knows Spring Boot already, right? Yeah, everyone knows Spring Boot. OK, uh, so well, it's a simplification in a way. It will allow you to create a, um, in a very simple manner, to create a Spring application. It comes with its own pre-configured dependencies. Um, it has embedded app server, which makes it ultra easy just to, uh, to run it. It packs in jar, not in war. You've heard that, uh, make jar, not war. It's what Josh Long actually says on every presentation that he makes. And it's also one of their concepts about this uh, so-called cloud-native Java. Um, if you want to do it, well, you already know this. Just check it out this site. It's called StartSpring.io, and there you can uh, immediately create your startup project and do it. Let's go a step further. So Docker, who has been working with Docker? Who knows what Docker is? So OK, I won't be doing any complicated Docker things here, so just know the basics. So it's kind of like a virtualization, process virtualization. I really do not want to get into the discussions here. It's a war out there, what kind of virtualization that is. So let's just stick with that. Uh, now, the good thing is that Spring Boot, along with Docker, they go quite fine. Especially that uh, Spring Boot is basically just one binary which is runnable. So at the end, you're just uh, packing your application. You have one jar file, and you just do java-jar, and then you have the application jar file, and that's it. And having just that, having just one entry point, it's ultra easy to containerize all that. So just to use Docker on top of that. What you need to do, actually, is just to do a uh, Docker file uh, to use the, basic, uh, the base Java image and then just define your entry point. And your entry point is just the Java execution. So I'll show all these uh, in a demo. Um, and yeah, so how can you even make this to be more simple? So as I said, it's rather simple just to have a Docker file and to do a manual Docker build. But where's the fun in that? So let's go one step further. You already have a Spring Boot application. You have Maven in the background. So let's just try to automate that. So one other interesting thing is that you can use the Spotify Docker Maven plugin. So it's made by the guys and the girls from uh, Spotify. And it adds one additional goal into your Maven build, which at the end produces uh, the, do the Docker image and immediately registers it onto your computer. And that's it. Um, so yeah, what, 
let's do a short demo. Now, I don't have my screen here. Actually, it's already just there. So that's why I'm actually doing this thing. And it's kind of laggy, so yeah, I might be a bit slow with this. Um, OK. So where was this? Uh, no, 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 not this thing here. Come on, come on, come on. OK. Good. OK, so the demo Spring Boot, Docker file, Spotify Maven plugin, and how to actually do this. So I will just open my uh, project. So it's here. What I did actually is that uh, this year I got invited to do a lecture at the university. They were having some competition there. Uh, and it was named Code App Level App, so abbreviation Kalu. And they were about to make some uh, block platform on top of that. So I just gave them like an introductory talk for Spring Boot and how they can create a block pla platform on top of that. So I decided to reuse the same thing here. It's simple. It will do the trick. So it's a very simple Spring Boot application. It's this thing here. Come on. Ah. OK. Good. Uh, so uh, let me just not get too much into the details, but I mean, just a regular Spring Boot application. We have uh, uh, the application. We have two controllers on top of that. We have models, so it's very simple. We just have blog posts. We just have users and uh, repositories in order to access that data. Now, what are the interesting things that I want to speak? So first of all, uh, here you need to have the source main Docker directory, and here we have the Docker file. Um, have you seen something similar like that? So basically, this is the recipe in order to create a Docker image. And what we do here is actually we take um, first the base image, and that is the Oracle JDK 8. So we take the Java image, uh, and some blah, 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 some uh, other customizations. Um, the important thing is that we're taking the snapshot jar, actually the uh, generated uh, output from our build. We're renaming it to app jar. And at the end, we're defining the entry point. And the entry point is just the execution for our application. So it's Java, dash jar, and then we have oh, the security stuff. And at the end, you can see it's the app jar. So that's basically what it is. And the second part here in order how to automate all this, so here in the POM file, we have the second piece. So if I go here, oh, come on. OK, first of all, um, just pay attention on to these two lines here. Um, so it says Docker image prefix. And I'll have two. Uh, now, what are actually these? Uh, this is actually the repository where uh, your Docker image will be registered or will be pushed to if you decide to, to push it onto a remote repository. So I have two here. Uh, the first one is SciLocker. You see that there, it has no prefix there whatsoever. That basically means that it's on um, Docker Hub. That's my, repository, uh, that's my repository there. And the second one is kind of weird looking. It says gcr.io, premium mark and stuff. So just remember that this is here. This is actually my private uh, repository on the Google Cloud Platform. And afterwards, in the demos, you will see actually where will this take place. So this is the second part. And at the end, the actual execution goes here. So here you can see the Docker Maven plugin. Um, so what we have here, yeah, so the image name. I'm, again, reusing it. So we have the prefix. And then we have the artifact ID. In this case, this is just Kalu block. That's all. Um, the directory, OK, where we have all this. And last but not least, we have image tags. Yes? Oh, can I enlarge it? OK, yeah. Yeah, the resolution is rather big. Edit. No, Java. Oh. This is the most cumbersome thing to do in Eclipse. Change fonts. Uh. I would say like this. OK. All better now? OK, good. 
And yeah, as I where was I? Ah, yeah, the images. So um, last but not least, uh, what we're doing here, we're tagging uh, the image, and we say, okay, first we tag it with latest, and then we're tagging it with uh, the project version. In this case, here is 003. So let's give this thing a go. So we'll say color block, and then k okay, run s. Ah, this is. And then here we have Maven built. And here in the goals, we'll have clean package. Very important. Before you do the Docker build, you need to do, uh, first do a package build. And then we say Docker build. Let's go. Well, this is huge. OK. So then it's building, seven tests. Well, yeah, just one small test. And now you can see. So now it's building the image, actually. Let's just wait. Um, yeah, it's just using gcr.io. It's here and build success. And you, we can see that it's actually tagged with latest and 003 snapshot. So let's try to run this. Um, so you can just say Docker images, and you'll see that we have a bunch of um, Docker images here. And I will just do this. So Docker, come on, Docker run minus port 8080, 8080. And then we say gcr. IO, Kelo block, latest, go. And this is a plain uh, Spring Boot execution, so you can see the, the launching sequence now. OK, let's just wait it a bit. And what it will do, it will launch um, the application here. So this is something else. This is not for you to see right now. And as I said, so this goes to localhost. We're marking it as on the port 8080. And here I have index. And here we should see the application. So this is the application. It's a block platform. So what we're doing, OK, now we will try to add a blog post. I need to log in first. OK, I'll log in first. I'm admin admin. That is my default username. It's not user and something weird. Um, let's go to index. So now we're already logged in. I'll just add a blog post. OK. I'll just say title ah, something. Then we have here also something. And we will create it. And there you go. So it's already functioning. OK. So this was the very simple example here. So let's go further. Um, OK. Here we are. What's wrong now? Oh, I already have it here. Ah, good. Let's go next for a step further. So who knows what Kubernetes is? Who has worked with Kubernetes? OK, so you're definitely in the right room. OK, so uh, my intention uh, here today is not to do a lot of um, you know, theoretical talk about Kubernetes or nor either to promote Kubernetes, but I would like to do uh, two, three quick demos and to get you into the grasp of how you can use it into your everyday life. Uh, so first of all, the word Kubernetes comes from this Greek word, which means helmsman or pilot. And having it's a Greek word, that basically means it's not pronounced Kubernetes. It's pronounced somewhat differently. I don't know. If we have Greek guys here, maybe someone can help me out. Um, so what, it, what is it actually doing? Well, first of all, it's a container orchestrator. It's one of the few that are already out there. Um, its actual definition, well, as it is on its uh, official uh, website, it's an open source system for automating Deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. A um, little less known, Kubernetes is actually based on Google Borg. Do you know what Google Borg is? Google Borg is this internal um, scheduling or container, or uh, I don't know how to call it, system that they're using into Google. What they're doing actually is that uh, that is their platform uh, in order to schedule all their processes, in order to schedule all, all their binary executions. Except that, for example, what they're doing there is they have one binary, uh, they just make a descriptor for it, what it does and how it should be launched, and then they just upload it or, I don't know, send it somehow to Borg. And what Borg does, it scales it immediately onto des the desired number of instances. For example, 10,000. Let's talk about Google scale. That's what it do. And what the guys from Google actually did was um, they took their more than 15 years of experience there working on that area, and they reused the same thing, and they made Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes is open source. It's not working with binaries. It's working with containers. By now, it's working with Docker. I don't know if other containers uh, are uh, supported. Um, it's backed by Google, mostly developed by Google, but currently not owned by Google. 
Initially, it was, was them, but afterwards, Google uh, partnered with Linux Foundation, and they made this. They made this Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation, and Kubernetes was their startup project there. And right now, we have even other companies that are backing up. We have IBM, we have Amazon, we have other companies there as well. So it's um, quite an active project. Uh, they're having uh, updates uh, all the time, so the latest version 1.4 um, got out like three days ago or something. Uh, how you can use uh, Kubernetes? Well, first of all, it's open source. It's free to download. You can download it. You can install it into your own commodity hardware. Even you don't need actually a cluster. You can just have one machine. You can install Kubernetes on top of it. That's it. It'll work. Second thing is um, you can reuse your existing Docker clusters if you have some. So Kubernetes can also work into a cluster into a containerized environment. So for example, if you have Docker Swarm already installed, you can easily deploy Kubernetes on top of it. And third, you can use the, the Google Cloud Platform, more especially in the Google Container Engine. Um, the Google Container Engine actually is what I'll be using today in two of my demos. Um, currently, I have there a cluster that is comprised of four nodes for machines. Um, I'm also using a G Cloud SDK, so that is a nifty tool in order to connect your Ubuntu with the Google Cloud. It's well, it's making things much, much more easier. And also, I have uh, well, actually, everyone has. Uh, a private uh, Google Container Engine hub. So whenever you're making your images, your Docker images, and publishing it, you already have your private space there. It's very near to your project. And afterwards, the execution of the images into the containers is going as fast as possible. Um, actually, you can all try it. So I don't know if this is still valid, but from Google, they had this promotional code there. So you can just sign up in order to test the Google Cloud Platform, in order to test the Google Container Engine. And they will give you like a $300 credits with a limitation to use it for like six months, no, three months, something. So if you're kind of interested after my talk, then just go there and give it a go. Now, first of all, just some basics about Kubernetes. So um, things that actually I think are like the most important in order just to get you started. So the list is a lot, lot, lot bigger than just these uh, few. Uh, but nonetheless, if you get this, then afterwards it will be rather easy for you to resume with uh, everything that's, that's out there. Um, first of all, um, what Kubernetes actually does is that it's employing, in a way, this immutable infrastructure. Have you heard about this? Have you stumbled about this? Anyone? OK, so it's kind of, well, it still doesn't have well, an official uh, Wikipedia definition about it. Um, there's still discussion about what it means, but um, as far as I'm concerned, there are like two points uh, that we need to carry out from that. So first of all is that with immutable infrastructure, uh, we're dividing the system into two pieces. The one is the data, and the other one is everything else. And we're saving the data. We're backupping the data. We're taking huge care about the data. And about the everything else, well, we're a bit disrespectful. Why are we a bit disrespectful? Well, that everything else is actually containers. And the containers, they kind of have this boundary between what is the software and what is the machine kind of gone. So it's everything just one thing. And in this uh, sort of environment, uh, whenever you need to make any change of a kind, for example, you need to do a bug fix, or you need to change some specifications on the machine, you're not doing changes. You're just wiping out the X machine, and then you're just um, de uh, deploying a new one on top of it. That's the point be, uh, behind the mutability. So you're not entering the machines, you're not changing them, but instead you're just wiping them off and replacing them directly. So having that in mind, what are the key concepts behind, uh, behind Kubernetes? So the first one is a pod. Uh, pod is like the single execution unit in Kubernetes, or the, single, uh, the tiniest scheduling unit that you, you can think of. Um, in definition, it says that it's um, a combination of uh, containers that by design are made to, to work tightly together. But they don't need to be more containers. It can be just one container. So one container can easily be just encapsulated into a pod, and that's it. Uh, it can be deployed on Kubernetes, and Kubernetes will execute it. By all means, it acts as a Docker container. It's there. It's running. Kubernetes is just managing it. Next thing is labels. So labels, I will just use a tautology here. A label is a label. Basically, it's just an arbitrary key value pair. And you can attach it uh, into the objects that you already have deployed into your cluster. So for example, you can uh, get a pod, and you will say that this is version something, or that this is, um, let's say, area integration, something like that, or anything what you ever wanted. So uh, in, on first, they have no syntactical value whatsoever. They're just labels. They're just sitting there doing nothing. But afterwards, they can be used rather smartly. So uh, you can make other concepts, you can make other objects there in, into your cluster which are using uh, these labels as selectors. So you will see afterwards into the examples how they're used. Next thing is deployment. 
And here, I also mentioned replication controllers. So uh, up to version 1.1 of Kubernetes, um, the desired way to go was replication controllers. And from version 1.2, the desired way to go is the deployments. This is, well, the central thing that you'll be doing there. What a deployment does is actually it's, it takes a definition about what your application is or what a single pod definition is. Uh, what are its specifications? Do you have some limitations? So, Things like this. Do you have labels that you want to attach to it? And um, last but not all, do you need to scale it? Do you need like more instances out of it? Then you take this, you make it into one single configuration file, you upload it into Kubernetes, and Kubernetes populates it. So if you select, okay, I need like 10 instances of this pod, it will make 10 instances of that pod. And immediately after that, it will make a controller. And that controller will make sure as much as it can that at all time, it will always have this desired state that you have claimed at the beginning. So if you have claimed that I want to have 10 instances, that it will try as hard as possible to have 10 instances. If one instance dies, it will populate immediately another one. If the dead one kind of revives again, then it will kill some of the other ones. But it will always make sure that this is already there. It's kind of taking care of the shape of, of your cluster. And now, up to here, we, already, we just have the deployment specific. So everything is functioning there, but it's kind of locked in. It's accessible from within the cluster, but nothing is out there. The next thing is services. And services is actually the exposement element of Kubernetes. So what, what a service does, is it takes a collection of pods, or one single pod, whatever, and then it exposes it to the outside or to the inside. And it gives that single service a name. That name, afterwards, it's actually accessible as a plain DNS name. So one very simple example is, I don't know, you make um, let's say, a REST API. And in order to scale it, you have like three instances of your REST API, and then you just define one service on top of that. The service connects with all three instances and generates a load balancer immediately. So you have to choose, you can choose between a node balancer or a node, node port. But a load balancer is actually just a round robin node balancer. And it can be internal or external. If it's internal, it's just available as a machine inside your cluster by the name REST API. If it's external one, then immediately uh, it will have its own external IP address. And if it's uh, on top of the Google Cloud Platform, it will be an actual physical load balancer, which will be working for you. And final thing, it's a persistent disk. So if one of your uh, pods is actually a database, uh, you cannot rely on that, that the pod will be alive all the time. So you need to take the data directory somewhere outside. And that is actually the persistent disk. So if you're talking about Google Cloud Platform, these are the, the persistent volumes that you can install somewhere. Why is this like that? Well, anything can happen to the pod. A machine can die, or the pod just simply can die. And you cannot just do that. Uh, your data will just go along with it. So uh, as I said, clear uh, separation between what is the data and what is everything else. That is your job here. Um, we have uh, some development recently. So uh, when I made these demos, 1.1 uh, version of Kubernetes was active. Nonetheless, it's still relevant. I mean, the concepts are, are still the same, except the deployments versus the replication controllers. Uh, so uh, from version 1.2, the deployments are there. We have just some new U UI, and we have some scaling improvements done. 1.3 version was quite major. Uh, so it introduced automated sc scaling, which is pretty cool. And here you actually just uh, lay it out to Kubernetes to see what is going on onto your cluster. And Kubernetes will say, OK, um, uh, you need to scale up or you need to scale down. It will autom automatically do that. You have cluster federation, which is basically just uh, working on, the, on different clusters placed on different zones. You have scheduled jobs. Uh, you have Minikube. Minikube is a very nifty way in order to start working on Kubernetes onto your own laptop. So it's a tiny application. Uh, it starts into a virtual machine, and you can use Kubernetes directly. And it has a dashboard UI. And three days ago, we have version 1.4. Um, there, the most significant improvement is that we have this new utility called Kube Administrator, which is making the installation of the Kubernetes cluster much easier. So you have just one in it in order to create a master node, and you have join in order to create all the slave nodes afterwards. So uh, enough talking. Let me do some other demos. So first of all, um, we will deploy the same image right now, but now we will be deploying on Kubernetes onto Google uh, Container Engine. Um, so I'll show you this visualization proxy. Uh, then, well, yeah, the controller, the pods, you've uh, you already seen those. Uh, then what is the service, how we can access the service, how we can scale it, how we can do a rolling update. This is something very interesting. And then how we can do the entire cleanup procedure. So let's see. Now where am I? OK. OK. 
Okay, now. Mm -hmm. So, you get nodes. Let me first see where am I. Okay, I am on to uh, the cluster. That's fine. Um, how was it now? Just one second. Here, okay, so the image is already there. It's built. It. Uh huh. Okay, first of all, I would like to show you this. So, in order to have like more visualized access to what is going on into our cluster, I'll start this. So, we have a proxy. Is it here? No, it's not here. It's here. So, I'll start a proxy. And then I will open a browser. And here I will say localhost, it's 81, it's static. Uh, so what I did is I'm at, uh, running actually a local proxy, which is connecting to the, the cluster. And it's kind of like proxying all the API so that I can install local applications here and that I can use it. So this is a visualization thing. And it will help me to see what is going on in the cluster. So um, OK, here, first thing that I will do is deploy. So I will execute the script and just say, what is deploy? So what I'm doing here, I'm just saying kubectl run Kalu block. So I believe that you cannot see it in the background. Sorry about that. I will just explain what the commands here are. Uh, so this is kind of like a Docker way in order to start it. I'm just running one single image. And immediately what's happening in the background is that Kubernetes is creating a replication controller. And it says, OK, now just have one instance. So that on the right side is the replication controller. And that is the actual pod that is started here. But this is just there now. So it's not really visible. I cannot access it. So in order to access it, I need to expose it. And when I do expose, I'm actually creating a service. So this is just kubectl expose, and I'm exposing it as a load balancer. And I say that the port is 8080. So what Kubernetes does is that it immediately creates a service. So right now, this is not accessible from the outside because I only have just an internal IP address. So I need to wait like a minute or so. But in the meanwhile, we say something like this. OK, so this application will be under heavy load. So we need to kind of scale it. So let's scale it. I'll just say scale. And what this scale actually does is that it says, get the replication controller named Kalu block and scale it up to four replicas. Do that. And you can see that we already have four replicas there. We already have four pods. Um, so what the replication controller will always make sure that's happening is that we will have at all time for replicas. So let's see something like that. So we have this. And let's try to kill one of these. So I will say kubectl delete pod kalu block dash 59 eht. So this might actually happen very fast, but let's kill it. So you see actually what's happening. So the old pod is dying, and a new pod is already being populated. And now, if you noticed, I already have a public API here. So Let's try to open it and go there. Now this is onto a different port. And I'll say 8080. And then here I have index. So I'll open it. Let's see what happened. Okay, it's waiting. But, ah, it's functioning, but that's not the thing what I expected. So what I actually forgot right now is that I, instead of the newest version, I actually installed the previous one. And this was before me making the, the design. Well, copying the design. Which, so. What we need to do is just to do a rolling update. And this is a thing in Kubernetes. So you can do a rolling update with zero downtime. So you need just to say, OK, now get this replication controller or this uh, deployment and update it with this image. That's what we're doing. So let's do a roll update. So this is version 002. And now I'll be updating to version 003. And what's happening in the background now, uh, what did I do? No. Come on. Stay, 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 stay. Good. OK, not this one, but this one here. So what's happening actually is that Kubernetes is immediately populating an extra replication controller. And this replication controller is here in order to change all these things. So the old one is starting to kill off its instances, while the new one is populating uh, the, the newer ones with, uh, with the newer version. And uh, here, actually, in the script, I say, OK, just do a rolling update, take this new image, and do some change on every three seconds. That means that it has like three seconds of refreshing, refreshing interval. So at the moment, I can try to access 
this, but I'm not really sure what will I get, because I don't know actually what the load balancer will do. Or, yeah, we have a hit. Maybe. Let's see. Docker plus Kubernetes. Well, yes and no. It's still there. Yes, there it is. So this is the newest version. So it means that my rolling update is already there. It has passed. OK. And let's see what the status of the cluster is right now. So yay, it's already there. You can see that we have just one replication controller. So the entire thing is already done. OK, let's move on to something more interesting. So at the end, I will just do a cleanup, which is the sh delete the replication controller, delete the service, and that's all, just to make sure that here everything will be empty. OK. This is the demo. Now, microservices. This is a very interesting image about microservices. So I will not be spending time explaining microservices. Basically, is you have just one shitty monolithic application. And at one certain point, you say, let's split it into multiple shitty applications and define a shitty protocol for them to communicate with. Now, if you're doing microservices just because you want to do microservices, I hate you. That's not the way to go. But if you kind of can make a clean separation of your application and you say that these things can work separately, can be developed separately, can be scaled separately, and that kind of adds value, then you're doing things right. And at that point, Kubernetes can be your friend, because at the very core, this is what it's supposed to do. So this is not my image, credited to Alvaro Sanchez. I don't know who the guy is, but thank you for this. Um, so how can you do um, microservices in Spring Boot? Well, rather simple. So uh, the application that we have right now is just one block platform into everything, and it's based around the MVC, uh, the MVC uh, paradigm, let's say, like that. So uh, we have the model, the database, and the entities. Then we have uh, the views, which is the user interface. And we have the controllers or the services in the background, which are doing the business logic. Let, we can split those. So we can say we can have one microservice just that handles the user interface, one microservice that handles uh, the, the controller part, and microservices, well, pods solely for the database. And that's it. So how will this look like? Um, let's, let me try to show you this. But with this thing here, it's rather oh, hard. OK, so here I have two applications. So now this Kalu block is separated into Kalu block service and Kalu block UI. Uh, so just a quick glance into it. So Kalu block service is basically the same application, just without the UI. It just uh, has a um, REST API. And now, um, instead of using an embedded uh, database as the regular Kalu block is using, now we're actually using uh, MySQL. That's all about it. And the second piece is the Kalu block UI. That is just the view piece. But now it has to have its own, well, stop services, stop controllers there. And these are the things that communicate with the other microservice. So here, this is just plain REST API. Well, since I'm using uh, REST res uh, resources here in Spring, that is HATEO REST resources. So it means that on the UI side, I already have Spring HATEO HATOS that is handling all these resources translation and doing things just right. That is the, the difference. And one single thing. So Previously, when I showed you this example, you saw that I made like four instances of the same application. That's not very good to do. Why? Because all of them are using in, uh, their own integrated database. They're, all of them are using H2. So when I accessed it, uh, actually the load balancer said, OK, now you go access the first pod. And for some time, I'm accessing the first pod, which is just a lucky coincidence. But if I just hold up a while and afterwards, if I refresh, then the load balancer will send me to a different pod, and then I'll have just nothing. So that's a very bad way to go. Why is that? Well, not just the data, but also the session. Here, the session was just uh, handled solely into the machines. That's very not the way to go. So now we have one centralized database, which is, well, kind of OK. We'll have MySQL in the background. But we also need to take care about the session, which means that if I log in into one pod, I need to be logged in into all the pods. So I will not lose my session if the load balancer do something. And what we need to do about it is that we need to do session replication. And one easy way to do session replication is by using Redis. So we have a Redis instance. And we say we're using Redis as a session storage there. And here in Spring Boot, it's rather easy. So I will just try to show you this. So here into Kalu block UI. Come on. Yeah, here. Kalu block UI. Source main Java. And here I have HTTP session config. And here you see that I have this enable Redis HTTP session. That's all. 
that you need to do. So just a configuration with this, and it's working immediately. It's already there, and Spring Boot will simply take care that the session will be replicated onto uh, the Redis instance, and the other nodes will simply just pick it up. Now, this is the splitting system. Now, let's see. Let's, let's deploy all this. Let's see what the fuzz is all about. So I'll just go back, and I'll just say, say to Kubernetes, it's here. But now I will deploy it in a much different manner. So uh, here I have Block deployment. And now I will deployment in the proper way. So the proper way is not to use commands, but to use descriptors. And the descriptors here are actually YAML files. So for example, let's start with MySQL. First, we need to define a pod for MySQL. This is what the definition for a pod looks like. So right now, we will not say we will create a pod. We'll have this image there. But we will just say create, and then just pass the YAML file. And Kubernetes will parse it. And it will immediately generate this. Now, I don't need to reinvent the wheel for MySQL. We already have images for MySQL. They're already there into the Google Cloud Platform. We can just fetch them. We can just use them without any problem. So this is the pod for MySQL. And we also have the service for MySQL. And again, you can just see that it says kind service. And there we have the labels. We have the selectors. So the thing that I told you about labels, these are the, 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 pr the proper utilizations for labels. One other thing here that we have the visualize, visualize true label. What that means is that this utility that I have in the background actually picks up all the objects that are uh, marked with this label visualize true, and it places them into the display. If it's not marked, then we'll simply not see it there. So this is actually how a YAML file looks like. In the other things, for example, let's say Kelo block UI. Here we have first the replication controller. It's there. And again, here I have name. And somewhere here you can see the image. So there it is, the containers. And this is the image. So now you can see that the images are split as well. We have Kelo block UI. We have Kelo block service. That's all. OK. Now let's try to deploy them. So no route to host. What happened? OK. Get notes. OK, that's not good. That means that the internet is not functioning properly. I'm connected. Anyone has a clue? <laughs> the internet kind of lost connection. Or maybe we just need to wait a bit. Yeah. Ah, OK. We're back on. OK, crisis averted. So uh, first of all, I will just restart the proxy. So I need to have it here in order to see everything that is happening. Come on. Go here. OK. We're here. Good. And then we'll just deploy all. Let's go. So now I have all of this to be deployed. So luckily, it will still be, oh, come on. We're having a very bad connection right now. And deploy all. OK, delete, delete, delete. Come on, get stable, get stable. I will need two more minutes for this. <laughs> if someone is using the speaker's wireless network, please just log off. I'm going to need the entire bandwidth there as possible. Uh, what's happening? Ah, OK. Let's see now. No, we still have something there. Maybe now it's fine. Let me see. Hmm. Just one second. I just need, need this to pass. No, it's this. OK, created, 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 created. OK, hopefully we're all good. Yes, we're here. 
here. Okay, so now I have the system already here in place. So you can see that now, now it's rather distributed. So I have service for the UI, I have service for uh, the service, yeah? And here I have the MySQL and I have the Redis instances as well. So at first glance, this looks fine, but well, I'm kind of troublesome with this connection here. We're using one centralized database, and this can be a bottleneck. So in order to do this properly, don't use MySQL, or just use a distributed version of MySQL, or just use Cassandra, or use Google Bigtable, something like that. Now, let's wait a bit. I should probably get here a public IP address. Until then, I can just show you some commands here. So by using kubectl get, we kind of see what resources we already have deployed into our cluster. So if I said get nodes, I should see the nodes. If I say get pods, then I will see the pods, everything that is out there. So I can say kubectl get RC, which is replication controller, and it will see what replication controllers I have if the internet is functioning. <sighs> yep. And one other thing is that now your pods are not just there. They're not dead. They're not unaccessible. You can, you can access them as every single Docker process that you can do. Uh, so in order to do this is say kubectl. One example is how to access the logs that are produced by a pod. So let's say I will do this. Kalu log UI latest, and then here I have 4n RPS. And you can see here that I'm seeing the actual log that is produced by the pod. So we're here. Now let's see if we have public IP address. No, not yet, or maybe I need to refresh this. Yes, we have a public IP address. So this is nothing new. I will just show you that this is functioning, that I'm not lying to you. And if we go 8080 again and say um, index, I should have the same user interface if I have internet. That is. Waiting for. Come on, come on, come on. Yes. OK, so uh, we're done here with this. I will just do a simple cleanup, or I will not do a cleanup, whatever. But nonetheless, you can access this uh, from, your, from your computers, from your phones right now. So I'll just leave it be. And I will go back to the presentation. And uh, it's this one here. OK, I will refer now to this thing here. So people were watching me, what I'm carrying with me, and think that it's a bomb or something. Um, so as I said at the beginning, you can install Kubernetes onto your own commodity hardware. And uh, you don't need to have just regular PCs. You can actually install it into ARM devices. So what I did actually is I made a five-node Raspberry Pi 2 cluster. I installed Hyperit OS on top of them. Hyperit OS is like a nice mixture of Raspbian, and it has Docker already packaged with it. So it's kind of hard to make Docker to run on Raspbian. With Hyperit, it's already there. So I took this, and then I installed the, the containerized Kubernetes onto it. It's Kubernetes version 1.1, so it's rather limited. It also has some other limitations there as well, nonetheless. But basically, it's functioning. It's there. Um, so for the stack, I 3D printed it. Uh, if you want to do something similar like that, you can just go to Thingiverse. My design is there. Just look for Kubernetes. It should just pop up. And my simple conclusion about this is, well, it works. It's cheap, but it's slower. Well, now this is uh, done with Raspberry Pi 2s. I can do it with Raspberry Pi 3s, and there it will be rather much faster. Um, if someone wants to buy five used Raspberry Pi 2s in order for me to buy 3s, then just yeah, approach me afterwards. And last but not least, this is ARM. So this is very important, uh, because you cannot just build an image into your own machine and just push it onto Docker Hub and then pull it onto uh, the Raspberry Pi and run it. It will simply not do. In order to run images onto ARM architecture, you need to build them into ARM architecture. So there are cloud platforms that allow you to do that. But if you don't want to spend money there, you can just build the images directly on the Raspberry Pi. It's, again, slower, but nonetheless, it will get the job done. So uh, this thing here, it's already connected. I will just switch now to the other cluster. So we're here. First, let's say, let's kill the proxy. OK, then go. Kubernetes ARM. I will just do this switch to ARM. So uh, one interesting thing uh, about kubectl is that it can support mul multiple contexts and multiple clusters. So you can easily just go from one cluster to another just by switching. Right now, I'm connected to this. And if I say kubectl, get nodes, um, ah, get nodes, here I will see all the five nodes that I have here. So 
I'll just start the proxy again. Then I'll open the browser. Come on. It's this thing here. Now, if I do refresh, you will see a completely different topology. Now, this is actually the output that is coming from, uh, from the Raspberry Pi cluster. And if you don't trust me, so uh, now here we don't have kind of this uh, services and external load balancer thing in place, because in order to use uh, actual DNS names on your custom cluster, you need additional plugins, which I didn't manage to install it here. It has problems, but that was like three months ago. Maybe now it's fine. Um, so in order to access it now, you, could, you just need to access the master node of your cluster. And here, because I'm using Avahi, in the background, this is already present, so this is Arpa Ecoop Master Local. So if you don't trust me, I can just refresh this, and this is the same application. But now it's running on one of the Raspberry Pis, and it's here. And it's again, it's functioning. I mean, I don't want to show you, but yeah, it's here. OK. So that's all that I have to say. Now, I can go on for this like hours and hours, I mean, explaining all the things there in the background. And especially for this, I mean, I can, just, I can never stop speaking. So uh, if you have any questions, we're out of time. Um, if you have any questions, just approach me here. We can discuss anything. We can discuss Kubernetes. We can discuss Raspberry Pi. We can discuss IoT, whatever you like. I'll be here. So thank you a lot for your attention. I hope you liked it. <laughs>